How can we capture the ideas, opinions, and conflicts of young minds and catapult them into the world? I'm Felicia Dominguez. And I'm Carla Chavez. On this show, we search for plays written by students, alumni, and faculty from the University of Wisconsin Parkside to adopt a farther reaching medium and one we love radio. This episode is focused on the ideas of love and time, the challenges and rewards of love, as well as how all things change with time. Stay tuned for interviews with the playwrights after each play. In our first piece today, produced by Carla Chavez, Time, Love, and Relationships are explored through an absurdist lens. Today, a 10-minute absurdist comedy by Jared Langwinski. Characters. Old man. Always wise and quick in response, but enters and exits the stage very slowly, often taking entire lengths of pages to cross out. Played by... Ishi Salazar. Old woman, matching in wit with the old man, but with a very rapid walking speed. Her responses, however, come very slowly, often many lines past her cue. Her words, like many grandmas, don't hit us until much later, as does our appreciation for her. Played by Lisa Kornetsky. Young man, an ambitious youth, but often oblivious to time. Played by Jared Langwinski. Young woman, an ambitious youth with an extraordinary patience. Played by Carla Chavez. Mother, a hardworking and intrusive parent. Played by Felicia Dominguez. Narration by Nicholas Olexak. Scene, an afternoon in January. A young man enters the house with skis and winter attire. He is shivering. January already. Jeez. Mom, I'm home with the groceries. Can someone give me a hand here? Old man. Enters incredibly slowly. Don't worry. Don't worry. I'll lend a hand. Mother enters. Are you ever going to shovel the snow? We're into February and the snow has really been piling up. I know, I know. I'll get to it, Mom. Uh, Can someone help me with the groceries? I don't want the meat to go bad. The old woman enters at rapid old person speed and rushes past the old man, who is still on his way over. She takes the groceries and brings them to the table. Meat can last for months in the winter. I don't even start using my fridge again until April. Well, it's March and I already don't trust it. I can go back tomorrow if you want. Why not today? The weather's not bad outside. Well, actually, I have a date today. He saves so much money. A date in the middle of April? Well, who is she? Where does she go to school? Did you check to see if she's a Catholic yet? There's nothing wrong with going on a date in May. Actually, my first date with Grandma took place in May, and it didn't end until late August. Have you done the laundry? Just the stuff I need. Young man, it's June. When's the last time you've done your laundry? She's waiting outside for me. Mom, we can discuss this later. Oh, we watched the sun go up and down, and then many other directions, too. Oh, I love you. Old man begins a very long walk over to old woman. Drive safe and be sure to bring water. You know how July can be in these parts of town. There's no time. I'm running late. The old woman leaves the spot she was in and gets a water bottle for the young man. As old man continues to slowly walk over towards the groceries, she then returns to her previous spot. Thank you, Grandma. The young man opens the door. The young woman appears at the door in heavy winter gear. Oh, gosh. Oh, gosh. I'm sorry I'm a little late. I can get distracted sometimes. He hands her the water. Don't worry about it. Do you mind if I take off my coat? I don't know what I was thinking wearing this in August. September, actually. Right. (laughs) Thank you. Nice to meet you, by the way. I'll get the water for you. The old man finally reaches the spot where old woman was and hugs her. Oh, I love you so much. The young woman begins drinking the water. So, uh, where would you like to go? There's a cool haunted house we can visit. Uh, I believe it just opened. I'll check my computer. Young man exits. So, any plans for kids? (laughs) I've had three myself. I hope it's not a weird question. You have been dating for nine months now. Right. And I know you would wait for marriage first. The old woman rushes up to mother and ushers her off stage. She loves showing her mom her favorite crosswords from the week's news. What's her favorite word? She hasn't decided yet. 
young man enters. So, it turns out the haunted house closed in the beginning of November. If you're interested, you can come visit my family and have Thanksgiving dinner? I would love to have Christmas dinner with you all. I haven't gotten you a present yet, though. I haven't had a chance to leave this house. Oh, phew. I haven't had a chance to get you one either. Shall we head out then? Sure. I think I'm going to bring my coat. It's rather cold out. Five, four, three, two, one. Happy New Year! Happy New Year! Happy Valentine's Day. Happy Easter. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Happy Fourth of July. Hey, where are you going? College. I thought we talked about this. But your Christmas present is still shipping from Singapore. It's okay. I have to go now. Goodbye. But just hold on a second. Young woman heads off stage. Mother returns. Are you ever going to get a job? Mom, I'm depressed. Well, so is everyone with a job. Now, I found you some listings in the paper and She's been gone for two months now. You're over-exaggerating. No, she left in August. Well, there's no use in standing still over it. Here, I'll get you some milk. The mother goes to pour him a glass of milk. The old woman returns rather quickly and watches her pour it with a look of disdain. Young man drinks the milk. My... Gosh, this milk is rotten. Well, when's the last time you went food shopping? Why does it always have to be me? I never said it did. I was just asking when you last went shopping, that's all. It's been a while. It was probably a year ago. Doesn't Grandma go food shopping for us, too? Well, for someone as quick as her, they never seem to come, do they? So why do I always get blamed for everything? Because you don't have an excuse. You're just lazy. I'm not lazy. I just lose track of time sometimes. And you think any employer wants to hire someone like that? All right, I get it. I worked at my job for 15 years straight. That's called reliability. And your kids never saw you. (laughs) But you all saw everything I did for you. Food on the table, toys to play with. The problem with your generation is that you don't appreciate anything that isn't placed bluntly and easily in your lap. And the problem with yours is that you, you spend so much time caught up in your own struggles that you can't consider any outside of your own. Get a summer job. Start somewhere. But it's only April. (laughs) That's what you said last April. I've been nagging you about this for an entire year now. Nagging is the operative word. Go to your room. Or at the very least, find another woman. You think this is about that? Well, what else would it be? The catch-22 of needing experience to get a job, but a job to get experience? The reality that despite our expansions in communication, bringing the world together with the touch of a button and being able to share a Big Mac with someone across the world, nothing will ever truly change and the world will continue to grow colder? The truth that our current school system teaches us nothing but the fears of being wrong, the rewards of taking shortcuts, and the authoritarian-style level of listening that made great nations fall and poor ones disappear completely? The uncertainties of life on other planets? The uncertainties of those underground volcanoes erupting any year now. Uh, Asteroids? Anxiety? A world where YouTube ads are unskippable and Netflix charges more than $9.95 per month? The ever-expanding rash on my left butt cheek? I still think it's about that girl. Yeah, it is. But it's only because when I'm with her, those other things don't seem as bad. Has she contacted you at all since leaving? No. You can't let this hold you down forever. That's all I'm saying. Also, your clothes are sitting in the washer. Can you hang them up, please? Yes, Mom. Mother exits. Oh, I do believe the milk is expired. You probably shouldn't drink it. Grandma, don't you think I should just give up on waiting? Well, if we're being honest, I usually send Grandpa to get groceries. That's probably why they aren't here yet. I just really need advice right now, and you seem to be the only person who really knows what to say in situations like these. You should respect your mother. Right. I'm sorry. She worked for 15 years straight to give you the life you have now. I I think maybe I need some time alone, now that I think about it. The old woman hugs him tight and then runs away. The old man enters very slowly with the groceries. You aren't going to help an old guy like me? Right. Sorry. Sorry. A lot's been on my mind lately. Your grandma told me about it. When? A couple of months ago. I really am losing track of days. Would you still like some advice? More than anything. I feel like things began so passionately, but have slowed down. Slowed down to a point where I don't know if she even knows I exist anymore. I feel like time is just moving without us. 
Well, that's all right. Sometimes love takes time. Sometimes it comes rather quickly. Grandma and I found love the moment we locked eyes on the dance floor, and months passed before either one of us blinked. Your parents, on the other hand, had three children before even realizing that they were married. There are times when you need a good pace and motivation to get through the harder moments in life, and times when you just got to slow it down before you lose all of the little things. That's why Grandma and I are so good together. Our minds work in different ways, and we never completely line up, but it's because of that that we're always aware of each other's speed. So we use that to account for each other and balance ourselves out. Isn't it a little scary, though, knowing you could be missing out on so much if one of you skips a beat? Uh, It can be. You know, there are times when I tell her that I love her, and she doesn't respond. I get a little paranoid, but then I remember that our minds and bodies work differently. One day, out of nowhere, I could be working on some nightly sewing, and she'd shoot right back at me with a, I love you too, and kiss me in a way that makes me feel all kitty and cobbly inside. I'd much rather a love that hits me out of nowhere than one that always comes when you expect it. Without Grandma, I wouldn't enjoy the winter. And without Grandpa, she wouldn't enjoy the summer. You can never take love for granted. You have to trust it when it comes and be willing to play with it a little. Any two-person job needs some refinement from both parties to get it right. But I think having that vulnerability can be exciting. It's like, Standing on a stage, opening night of a performance, you know you have what it takes. But to actually show someone that, without getting in your head, (laughs) it's hard. So, should I go for it? Well, if she hasn't given up on you yet. After all, we've been having this conversation for three years now. Right. Oh, gosh, what am I doing? I need to find her immediately. Now... If you don't mind, I'm going to sleep with the wrinkled version of the woman of my dreams. Old man exits slowly. Gross. Anyway, I just, I gotta trust myself. Maybe she still likes me. I know I still like her. I just need to find her, explain myself. I don't know. I'm sure it will hit me when it happens, right? Right. Okay. He opens the door. Standing there is the young woman in a sweater with snowflakes on it on a very sunny day. Hi. Hi. I'm sorry I didn't keep in touch. Getting a signal can be a pain up north. That's real. So I guess what I'd like to ask is On April 23rd, 2021, will you marry me? They wait for the old man to finish exiting. Oh, man... Am I interrupting? (laughs) These bones can't get me out of trouble anymore. Exits. I will. Happy New Year. And I love you too. End of scene. You're listening on WIPZ.org and 101.5 FM, and you're hearing the special WIPZ radio play program. And I have Jared Linguinski with me here today, and he wrote today. How'd you get the idea for the play today? Um, <laughs> it, it was a very, very late night, um, probably, gosh, two years ago, I believe. Um, it it was just one of those nights where, you know, a bunch of people are doing homework at, you know, like two or 3 AM and, and I just, I was, I was, you know, on my second wind, I was, you know, wide awake, but out of it and all that. And, and I, I just started getting really existential and, (laughs) um, 
I, I think it started, um, I, I started writing one of the monologues towards the end, um, which you'll see as the old man. Um, and I just, it was, I just kept kind of stream of conscious writing. And then once I kind of had that, I was like, Ooh, this could be like, you know, an entire, entire thing. And, and so I just, I just kept writing and writing and writing. And then after, you know, a couple hours I was like, Oh, that's kind of cool. I, I went to bed and then I looked at it again like a week later and I was like, oh, this is actually kind of a cool script. And so I edited it a little bit more, showed it to people. And uh, yeah, apparently my best writing takes place uh, when I'm really, really <laughs> sleep deprived. That's really funny. Uh, was that your first play or have you, how, many, how did you get into playwriting? Um, I, my, I, my first play, um, I wrote a one act about a year before that, that was kind of my first um, uh, play that I wrote. It, it didn't go over well. Um, I, I showed it to a few people and, you know, like it was just, you know, kind of eh, reactions. And yeah. um, I, I do really want to touch back on it someday because I really liked the concept. But um, a- a- after that, um, I think what inspired me was uh, the theater department was doing a 12-hour theater fest Um and they were looking for 10 minute plays. And I think that kind of put me in the mood to start writing some of those after today. Um, I wrote a few more uh, 10 minute plays, and I'm currently in the process of writing another 10 minute play, although that might become a one act based on how it's going. Oh, that's um, great. So, just to kind of submit for this year's 12 hour theater fest, if, if you guys haven't checked it out, it's a really, really fun um, thing. I mean, it, it just a bunch of people getting together who are passionate about theater. They split up into directors, actors, technicians, and within the span of a day, you get a script, you work on it, and by the end of the day, you perform. It's 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 a whole lot of fun, and that was my first exposure. A couple of my plays got performed um, at that at that uh, day, um, so that that was really <laughs> wow. fun. Um, so I haven't written I haven't written many plays. Um, probably probably like five ten minute plays and a one act. I used to do a lot of songwriting. Um, and that's kind of taken a back burner as, has a lot of extra activities <laughs> in my life I've taken lately, but, um, right. yeah, no, I mean, it's just, I, I think I write as, as a form of therapy in some ways. Like I just, like writing for me comes at peak moments of just either great humor and happiness or great, you know, existential crisis mindset, whatever. Can you explain um, that a little more? Existential. Yeah, just kind of this <laughs> this idea of, of your thinking about now and the future at the same time, and you're also thinking about all your past decisions that have led you to this moment. Mm-hmm. And so there's all these layers of like, oh God, where is my place in the world right now? That kind of existentialism. Oh wow. Um, and I, I, I think that, that. <laughs> I, I think that kind of you know plays in with with the themes of of this ten minute. Um, just a lot of characters dealing with time moving in in weird ways and very um, non-conventional ways uh, for the characters. Yeah, can you explain a little more about uh, absurdism and why you chose to write the play in this style? Uh, I love absurdism. Um, I, Growing up, I've just always been attracted to humor that's uh, weird or random or ironic. And um, once I found out, once I got into theater and I found out there was a genre for that, I was like, ooh, that's really cool. And so I got involved, like, reading, you know, Ionesco plays and things like that. And just not only absurdism, but a lot of abstract works, um, such as Almost Maine, which I got to perform in a few years ago, um, and plays like that where, you know, like, on the surface, it's normal situations, but everything about them have weird, surreal elements. Um, I'm, I'm really attracted to that kind of um, convention. And so I think that it wasn't my intention to write an absurdist play, but it just kind of happened that way. It just kind of came out yeah. in your mind. Yeah. Cause you're just used to that genre. And, yeah. And I, yeah. I find that abstract stuff is my most commonly written stuff. Um, I think the only thing I, I wrote that wasn't abstract was, um, the one act, but I, I write a lot of abstract stuff. That's interesting. And so with your abstract stuff in mind, like what was the message that you want to send with the play today? That at the end of the day, everything is going to be okay. I mean, you know, we spend so much time getting caught up with so many minute details and every little thing that we do wrong and 
you know, we get existential and we get, you know, all these, all these things going on, um, you know, especially with issues of love and relationships. And, you know, I, I think it's really encompassed by the monologues towards the end where the old man talks about the variations of love and how it's okay for things not to always line up because that has its own benefits, you know, regardless of Mm -hmm. how things go, if you want it to work, you know, you can make it work. Um, and, and just, just kind of a sense of, of relief and hope I think is important to, um, for me to kind of get across, you know, I just, I I wanted this play to, to make people, you know, to make them enjoy themselves and, and, and laugh at this existential crisis a little to, to find, empathy and and find um relief relief and hope oh that's a big one that's Mm -hmm. beautiful and how do you think this relates to like your motif of time um because you know i mean we in our everyday lives get so caught up with time and you know we focus on, on on the smallest things and we extend them and we you know we could one little thing could happen to us during the day and we could be thinking about it you know the whole day and it could take away time from us yet you know in good moments we sometimes don't realize what we have until it's gone or mm-hmm. you know until years later and we just we with the way our society is moving so so quickly there's always so much to do at every given moment of the day you know it's important to you know take time for yourself or take time for others sometimes and just really sit in a moment and I think I think that's kind of how the play concludes when the world around the characters it just continues to move incredibly fast wow that's pretty deep I like that (laughs) (laughs) that's definitely interesting I think it is important to like step back and also realize what's going on in time Mm -hmm. in your life definitely and you've kind of given me a lot to think about myself (laughs) my own extensive existentialism and moving on to something else, how is it like acting in your own play? It's weirder than I thought it would be. Um, I think at first I was like, oh, I already know exactly what I want because I wrote it, you know. But then when I actually started reading for it, I was like, I had to think about it a little bit more, you know. It, it didn't necessarily, like, for some reason speaking it out loud changes things sometimes. Mm-hmm. Um, so it just kind of caught me off guard a little bit. Not too much, um, but, you know. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's enjoyable getting to act in my own, um, piece, but I, I, I don't know, like, I, I think sometimes with, with, you know, writing things, it depends on the piece and the character. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there are some, usually there's like, and I feel like this can be said about a lot of playwrights, but like, usually there'll be that one character that you feel the most connected to when you're writing, um, or that is the most inspired from yourself. And so... Yeah, it in, seemed pretty autobiographical. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and for me in this play, it was kind of a mixture um, between the, the young man and the old man. It was like a conversation with myself so, at some points. Oh, that's interesting. Um, and just kind of the debates I have internally um, about how I handle things in my life. Um, and so that's why it was partially therapeutic for me. But also a little creepy, I guess. <laughs> talk to yourself <laughs> yeah literary works i don't know <laughs> it kind of makes sense though <laughs> yeah ig- ignore that one we'll, we'll it's better <laughs> than like talking to yourself out in public or something when it's art it's acceptable <laughs> yeah when it's art it's acceptable definitely <laughs> what has been your experience seeing your play done on a different platform like radio it's it's really interesting i mean this play definitely wasn't written for radio purposes there's a lot of indication in the blocking and um, you know, there's there's a lot that the actors will do on stage during this show, um, ideally. So translating that to a radio uh, piece was a little bit complicated. I had to decide what was important to read and what was important not to read as far as what happens in between lines. Um, so that process was really challenging for me. Um, but now that I kind of know that this is an option, I might be interested in writing things that are more geared towards radio um, oh. in the future. But um, who knows? Who knows? It's a good idea because I know you've done radio before yourself, right? Yeah, I, I used to be a part of WIPZ. Um, I, I, I had a show um, for a couple of years uh, with my, my good buddy Sterling, and that was a whole lot of fun. Um, so I'm, I'm definitely no stranger to, to radio, and 
I, I mean, I like, I like voice stuff. Voice stuff is fun. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah. That's good. Uh, what other things have you done in the theater? Oh, gosh. Really? Uh, <laughs> uh, well, my primary focus is acting, mm-hmm. but I do lighting, carpentry, um, you know, playwriting. I did. I did, worked professionally doing props over the summer um, wow, at, at an opera house in Utah. So, I mean, I'm painting. Um, I'm all over the board, but I try to. I'm trying to keep my focuses mainly on acting and lighting. Um, okay. Yeah, th- those I would say. Oh, and directing. Directing, I also do a lot of. <laughs> I. <Okay. laughs> um, That's good to like be broad and. Yeah, yeah, and I, stuff, I actually yeah. um, for the twelve hour theater festival, the first time the show and the only time the show's ever been performed on stage, I actually was able to direct it, which was and I I I, I enjoy directing my own works more than I think I enjoy acting in my own works. Oh, okay. Um, not not for like any negative reasons, just because mm-hmm. I'd much rather watch the picture than be a part of the picture when it's my own work. Oh. Um, but yeah, I, I do directing as well. Um, I have a love hate relationship with it. Um, <laughs> but yeah, a- acting and lighting primarily is the roundabout that's answer good. to that question. Yeah. Oh, that's good. Do you have any like final director's notes you want to leave us with? I, I'd really love feedback. I mean, I, 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 I'm constantly trying to, you know, improve myself, improve my work. And I, I, I'm more, I'm less interested in, in, I mean, as I said before, you know, just a sense of hope and a sense of relief are really important for me. So I, I'm more interested to how people feel about it rather than how I feel about it. You know, I, I, I'm much more interested in, in, the, in the audience reaction as opposed to the textual um, purpose. Um, if that makes any sense. Okay. Interesting. All right. <laughs> Thank you, Jared, for, you know, contributing your play and being our one of our first playwrights in this program and yeah. uh, interviewing here today. No problem. <laughs> yeah. So you're listening on WIPZ.org and 101.5 FM. Stay tuned. In our second piece, So Far, produced by Felicia Dominguez, a series of memories from the relationship of a couple are captured and reorganized. So Far by Michael Dahlberg. Characters. John, a man, played by Andrew Sherman. Beth, a woman, played by Rain Kleinofen. Jonathan, a man younger than John by at least a few months, maybe years, perhaps someone completely different than John, played by Kevin Duffy. Rebecca, a woman, younger than Beck by at least a few months, maybe years. Perhaps someone completely different than Beck. Played by Jenna Eve Kleinofen. Place. The living room of a small home. A house the perfect size and intimacy for a couple beginning a life together, yet perhaps too small for a family to grow in. Time. Both the beginning and end of an era. Need help with those boxes? No, I got it. Ugh. Just well packed, that's all. Kinda. Crammed it all in, didn't I? We all have our talents. Some people are really athletic. Some have an eidetic memory. You can put a bunch of crap in a small space. I like to think of it as a superpower. Yeah? Well, next time find someone with super strength to move it. I can help you with that. No, no, I, I got it. I, I hauled the rest of it. Not wasting any time, are we? None to be wasted. <laughs> Are you sure you've got that? Oh, yeah. No sweat. I can at least get the door. I can manage. Yeah. Sure. Wow. I forgot about this picture. All right. One last look around. Yeah. And uh, how exactly did you think this was going to go? I don't know. I guess like this. Only fewer boxes. You knew what you were getting into. And what if I suddenly changed my mind? (laughs) What if I change mine? You wouldn't. I'm wonderful. (laughs) Oh, I love how humble you are. (laughs) It goes well with your narcissism. (laughs) You knew what you were getting into. I definitely did. Shouldn't we unpack before we decorate? (laughs) By that logic, we'd never decorate. We would, just like next week. 
you've been here three years and never got past the unpacking phase. <laughs> I think I'll take things into my own hands. I just think we should talk about it. Okay. Where do you think this picture should go? Back in the box. Seriously? I don't know. <laughs> Good talk. I love you. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, go get the table from the other room and bring it in here. Look nice with your couch. I thought I was on unpacking duty. I changed my mind. I thought you were used to that by now. <sighs> Who knew you had so much stuff? Well, I did. Why didn't you say anything? <laughs> because I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to put the furniture in place and call it a day. Anywhere you want. You're just going to change it anyway. <laughs> Probably. Someday you'll come around to my style. Your style is nothing. And yours is everything. <laughs> Where do you think that picture should go? I don't know. <laughs> I have an idea. This room has enough for now. There are other rooms that need your firm hands. Hmm. Oh, really? And uh, which room could you possibly have in mind? Your bedroom? No, our bedroom. <laughs> oh, you make me sick. <laughs> I'm going to be sick. Can I get you anything? You've done enough. All right. Well, I'm just in the other room if you need me. I hate you. I love you. You're not getting out of this. But I have so much to do by Monday morning. You've known about this for weeks. It's not my fault that Jer got sick. And it's not my fault that you volunteered to take this workload. Who else would do it? Anyone else. It'd be easier to handle if I could just stay, instead of hauling all of my work in the car. It's already in the car. But the deadline is... Jonathan, please. It's my family. I can only tell them so much. You need to actually meet them. Don't you want to? Yes, of course. I've always intended on meeting them. At the wedding. Are you planning on proposing? Not right now. Then get in the car. What if I proposed right now? You'd have to spend a lot of money and still have to meet them. You have a lot to get done. I know. I love that you're so driven, but it's a weekend to meet my parents. Is that really asking so much? No. No, it's not. Then you're coming. No place I'd rather be. Do they at least know I have a lot of work to do? They know you're very important, yes. But you can do all your work when they're out or have turned in. I'll be sure to use candlelight to not wake them. Candlelight? How romantic. I was thinking more about the hot wax. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> the sooner we get in the car, the sooner you can play curator of the wax museum. <laughs> Does that mean I get to make a replica of you? Get in the car and you can have the real thing. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'm sorry. I don't mean for you to think that I find your family unimportant. I. It's okay. The whole forced through the trees thing. <laughs> I know. Got your phone? Yep. Wallet? Yes. Keys? Yes. Let's go. Is that you? Who else? I knew you'd forget them. Hush. Well, don't just stand there. Go change. Not tonight. I'm exhausted. Well, take a quick shower. It's been a long week. Which is even more reason to go out. I can't even think about going out that door again. Need to sleep. You spend all your time at the office or here working as if you're in your office. You need to get out. I need to sleep so I can get up early tomorrow. John, babe, come on. You're running yourself ragged. It all has to get done. I told you going back to college full time and holding a full time job were too much. So it's my fault? I didn't say that. That's what you meant. I, I meant you knew this going in and the importance of giving yourself some time to let off steam. Go with your friends. I don't think I'd be the best date tonight. You're the only date for tonight. I'll stay. What? No. Go. If you're staying, I'm staying. I'm going straight to bed. Then I guess I'm getting a good night's rest. Wait. You're beautiful. I know. <laughs> Let's go. Out? That's what we planned, isn't it? <laughs> it is. Crap. Where are my keys? Did you lose them again? No, I, I didn't lose them again. You're always setting them down. Are they in the lock? I am not. And no, they're not. Well, just use mine and look for yours tomorrow. Oh, I need them. Relax, we can... That ring has my office keys and the keys of the computer lab and... Where the, the... could you have possibly put them since coming through the door? I don't know. You've only been in this room. I don't know. Just go. I've got to find them. I'm really not in a social mood. 
John, I... You know I'm busy. You never let me forget. Then stop asking me to go out. I can't tell my friends you ditched me again. Then don't. Say I'm still at the office. That's what I always say. And it always works. All right. If that's what you want. It's what we both need. Sure. Good night. Night. I need a shower. Come in. What? Uh, I said come in. The door is unlocked. Hello? It's unlocked. Just open the... Oh. Sorry, I swear I left unlocked for... Hello? What the... Hey! How did you get in? (laughs) Back door. Key under the mat. That's only for an emergency. This is one. I urgently needed to see you naked. Is that right? Apparently I came just in time. You are known for your timing. That's what all the men tell me. Ever think about having kids? I might need a lot of practice. Oh, what a shame. Guess we better review the steps then. (laughs) It shouldn't take too long. Let me go with you. Stay. You have to do work. I can make time for this. It's not your problem. And it's not yours. It's ours. It's depressing. It's not your fault. These things happen to all kinds of people. But what if... What if he says, I can't. Ever. We'll cry together. But there are other options. Like a dog? That's not the same. We'll get a thousand dogs. (laughs) I don't want to go today. Stay in with me. We'll go together first thing in the morning. Tonight, let's watch a movie. Which movie? Our movie. (laughs) Deal. Let's get to studying, though. Studying instead of having fun. I'm taking a quill out of your porcupine and going to get things done first and celebrate later. How grown up of you. Mm, And how terribly boring. How much do you have to do? Not a lot. Just a bit of reading and then a review. Five page minimum. Double space? And 12 point. They'll take you maybe 30 minutes. (sighs) But it's so boring. Then do it tomorrow. I never thought I'd live to see this day. You agreeing to not do work. The work you have is simple. It can wait. What would you rather do? Hmm, I don't know. I feel like staying in. We could always put that movie in again. (laughs) We never finish it. Is that a bad thing? Did I say that? I'll put it in then. (laughs) (laughs) Just don't talk along with the movie. I won't make any promises. I can't get into the movie when you're quoting it beside me while it happens. Well, after seeing it 14 times, You tried watching it 14 times? Oh, we really need to finish it. And whose fault is that? Yours. Mine. Look at the goat calling the ram (laughs) horny. (laughs) It's not my fault that you can't keep your mind on the movie. It's not my fault that you look better without clothes on. (laughs) You're terrible. You like it. See, right now, I can't decide which which of your parts are the cutest. (laughs) Your elbow is pretty cute, but maybe only because I can't see your shoulder. (laughs) Hey, definitely not cuter. I beg to differ. Oh, what about your belly button? (gasps) Jonathan, your hands are cold. Oh, no, I got it. The (laughs) freckle on your hip. (laughs) We're going to finish this movie. And if not, we'll certainly finish something. (laughs) (laughs) Oh. What's wrong? Just slept wrong last night. It hasn't let up. Here, let me help. I'm a master masseur. No, it's okay. No, it's not. Relax. Oh, wow. (laughs) That feels so good. I think I could just live on your touch. I think I could just let you. I... (laughs) I know. I just want to go to bed. It's 6 p.m. Which should tell you exactly how I'm feeling. Just got home. Which should tell you exactly how my day was. Let me help. I haven't given you a massage in ages. Sit down and I'll... Really? I just want to go to bed. That's too bad, because I was just about to make a couple deli meat sandwiches. With potato chips? I don't know any other way. I love you. I know. Fourteen times. That's a lot. Shut up, or it'll be fifteen unsuccessful attempts. Just really goes to show how often we hang out. And most of our hangouts are watching this over and over. 
Are you mad about it? I didn't say that. It's just that something's been on my mind. And that is? In the last two months, I think I've spent two nights in my own apartment. Do you want us to spend more time at your place? With my roommate? No way. I just... To make things easier on me, how would you feel about me leaving some of my clothes and things here? That would definitely reduce your travel times. Right. And I'd see you a little more, even, which I'd like. I would, too. Does that mean it'd be all right? Honestly, it doesn't sound like the best plan. What is with you lately? What do you mean? You keep looking at me like something's wrong, and then I ask, and you say, I'm imagining things. I can't be imagining things all the time. Nothing's wrong. Then what's right? What? If nothing is wrong, then what is right? What's going on? What are you saying? It doesn't make sense for you to leave some of your clothes here. But I'm here all the time. Exactly. Exactly what? You spend all your time here, so all your things should be here. Are you... I don't know how to say it. Then just say it. Don't be mad. Oh, God. What happened? Nothing. It's not bad. Then what is it? I'm pregnant. Are you saying what I think you're saying? Rebecca, move in with me. This is the best news. Come here. So, you're excited? Of course. How could I be anything but? We need to celebrate. Uh, Should we tell our friends so soon? I mean, I've only just been along for a few weeks. And you didn't say anything? I don't want it to be a fluke, but I couldn't hold it in any longer. Uh, We'll celebrate here, by ourselves. We have plenty of time to tell everyone else. How? Let's go try for twins. (laughs) I don't think that's how it works. Only one way to find out. (laughs) I can't wait to tell everyone. What if they think it's too fast? Do you think it is? Maybe, but it feels right. Then who cares what they think? This is perfect. I can be moved out and in here by the end of the month. I can't wait to see my roommate's face when I tell her. She just got into a relationship with this guy, Jer, and thinks the world of him, always going on and on about him. I just want to hit her in her fat face. They're at the bar on 63rd tonight. Let's go meet them there. And hit her? Right in her fat face. Does it have to be malicious, or can we just be happy to share the announcement? I don't see why we can't do both. Are you really going to hit her? In her fat fat face. face. (laughs) (laughs) All right, then. And we can use the guest room for the baby's room. We'll just have to get a crib sometime soon. John. My mother kept mine and, and offered it, but I told her I wanted something more like a modern Marvel and less of a classic death trap. <laughs> John. And we can paint the room whatever color you'd like. I was thinking something neutral, something that didn't say boy for blue or pink for girl. And, you know, because who cares? What... John. What? Take it easy. We still have a bit before we're in the clear. It's a sensitive time, and who knows what could happen. But I'm excited. I am, too. But let's just keep calm, one step at a time, okay? Okay. Oh, did you see her fat face? She's so jealous. Glad you shared our big announcement for a good cause. Oh, but she's so full of herself. We did the world a great good in shutting her up. You know she's going to convince him to let her move in after this. But we did it first. That's what matters. Grand gestures, you mean? Yes. Were you not there? Did you not see her and all her fat face (laughs) stop saying that i've always thought it was the little things you know less about who's moving in with whom and more about who's giving a sly wink from across the room or who's holding hands under the table or who's only looking at one person out of a whole room full of people are you coming no what do you mean no staying in i don't want to see people i don't want to either but we have to go Jer will understand why we're not going. That doesn't mean she will, and it's her birthday. We've been through enough without her narcissism. She's my best friend. You don't even like her. That's not the point. You need some time away from people. Don't tell me what I need. Then don't make stupid decisions. You think you're helping? More than you are. As though life hasn't been stressful enough, you just keep pushing things. I'm upset too. Then stop adding to the problem. I swear it's always something with you. You never want to go out, and I always have to drag you to make an appearance like some sort of celebrity who can't be bothered. I'm busy with work. And work is so much more important. I never said that. You don't have to. 
So you're just going to put words in my mouth then? I'm going to put honest words in, yeah. Beck, I have things to do. Fine! Stay home. Do what you want. You always do. Beck, you should rest. Stay in with me. I already told them I'd be there. I have to go. They'll worry. Why did you tell them that? Because I need a distraction. You need to heal. Same thing! You just keep talking and talking and fighting. You just add stress. You want me to calm down? You want me to heal? Then leave me alone. It's not what you want. What did I just say? Not in the right mind. So I'm crazy. That's not what I said. You implied it. You do this to yourself. You do this to me. Come with me. Please. I can't. I need to work. Of course you do. Beck, I... You say you want to help, but when I tell you how, you refuse to do it. I have deadlines. I'm more important than deadlines. Beck, wait. Let go of me. This is your fault. All of this. You. You and your need to be catered to. Your refusal to change your life for someone else, always asking them to change themselves for you. You are not the only person in my life. And you're sure as hell not acting like the one who loves me the most. I may be focused on my work, but that's because some of us know how to be adults. How to actually take care of themselves and others. There's more to life than money. But we need money. We need each other. You're being reckless. And if you walk out there, don't expect me to smile when you come home. I'm going to that party. I'm going to drink. And I'm going to forget. With any luck, I'll forget how to come home. There's a new position at work. That just opened up, I mean. What about it? Do you want it? It'd be a great opportunity. And quite a large pay raise. Money isn't everything. I know. I just think that we could do with a little savings. We're kind of starting a life together, you know? You're already at your wit's end finding time for everything. You barely even call your mother anymore. You're so busy with work. Well, I was also finishing up classes. So you want to go right back into having no time for anything else? I'd like to see you more often than just when I turn over at night. I know. I'm sorry. I've just been trying to get overtime. But if I get this job, I wouldn't need overtime. But you'd still get it, if you could? I mean, yeah, but... (laughs) That's what I mean. There's no stopping you. You need to take a step back. Can't I have a little time with you to actually enjoy being a couple? Or are we trying to skip ahead to the worst parts of marriage already? It's not like that. Please. I need you to be behind me on this. I can't get behind never seeing you. What if I promise to give you at least one weekend a month in which I won't do any work? Hmm? One weekend? That's it? At least. It's a compromise. A whole weekend. Not partial hours, but a whole weekend. A whole weekend. All right. This means so much to you. But I need that whole weekend. I want to spend time with you and not be jealous of your paperwork. Deal. Can this weekend be the first guarantee? I have two documents to finish, then I... Jonathan. What do you have in mind? I was thinking about renovating the bathroom. The bathroom? Yeah. Maybe we spend the weekend seeing if the shower needs to be replaced. What's wrong with it? I'm not convinced it can fit two people easily. But it... Oh. (laughs) (laughs) Where have you been? Out. With whom? My roommate and Jer. She's not your roommate anymore. Yeah, well... Yeah, well what? Nothing. They're doing better? Yes. They've just moved in together. You'd know that if you'd come to the party. I wish them better for it. Better than us, you mean? didn't say that. You never do. But it will be better for them. Jer is a great guy. Is he? What's that tone? What should it be? He's your friend. He is. Remember that. Don't be stupid. Why not? It works so well for you. Don't you have a book to be reading instead of lying awake waiting to talk to me? Is that why you came home so late? So I'd be busy or sleep? I don't have to come home late to not talk to you. Especially when you want to go out and talk to other men while I stay home. If you're so upset about it, come out with me. Some of us don't have to go out all the time. Some of us don't need to always stay in. Some of us aren't alcoholics. Some of us aren't workaholics. I know I've been busy lately. 
and I'm sorry. I don't mean to ignore you all the time. I just honestly tune everything out. I know. It'll get better. Once I adjust to the new job. At least you're cute with your nose in a book. You could choose me over your friends. You could choose to actually spend time with me when I'm home. You know, actually look up from your desk. One of us needs to be reliable and stable. You don't have the best track record. Excuse me? Are you blaming me for the mis- Yeah, I have to admit, you didn't help yourself avoid it. I shouldn't have come home. I couldn't tell you thought this was your home. All right. I've got to go. Work calls for me, too, you know. I just keep it at the office. (laughs) Okay. I'll work on this and try to be done by the time you're home. Don't try. (laughs) Well. And make sure you call your mom back. Shoot. That's right. She misses you. She's worried about you, too. All right. Yeah, I'll do it in a bit. Do it now. But. Jonathan. I'll do it right now. I'll see you tonight. Looking forward to it. Hey, Mom. Yeah, it's Johnny. How are you and Dad? What do you mean he's out riding? He broke his leg two weeks ago. There's no way the doctor approved of him going back out there. He's going to re-rake it. You know that. Why are you letting him go? Of course you can stop him. Well, no. I don't suppose he'd appreciate it, but... I guess. He's always been a bit of a wild one, hasn't he? How have you put up with him so long? Oh, gross. I don't want to hear about that, Mom. No, I don't have anyone to tell you gross stories about. I know, I know. No, I'm not seeing anyone, but that might change. I have a date tonight. No, I'm not making this up. Yes, Mom. A real girl. You ever think this is why I never mention dates to you? She's about my age. We met in class. No, she's less into the job and more into the lifestyle she can get from it, I think. Not everyone needs money saved up, Mom. She is not like Dad. She seems... Well, I guess I don't know how she seems. This is our first date. But she's great. She always has the best commentary in class. She's super smart without even needing to study. And she always has this great energy about her. And her hair. Never mind. But when I asked her out... Okay... So she asked me. Who cares? Shoot, that's her. I'm going to have to let you go, Mom. Where are your keys? I left them. Where? I don't remember. Really, Mom? I've got to go. Do you want me to go on this date or not? I'm trying to be calm about this, but... You're never going to have grandchildren if you don't shut up. (laughs) Okay. I love you, too. Bye. I was starting to think I had the wrong place. Sorry, I was on the phone. Another woman? My mother. Hmm. I should have lied and said it was another woman. (laughs) (laughs) I'm going to choose to find it endearing. Thank God. You ready? Yeah. Where are we headed? Let's find out. I'm sorry. About? The keys. You can replace those. It's the principle. I understand. I didn't mean to say the keys. Well, I did, but... I know. Yeah. What if I hadn't been here? You're always here. What if I hadn't answered? You always answer. I can't keep answering. I can't keep coming home. So you think this is home? I don't have other options. I'm not forcing you to live here. What do you expect me to do? I don't know. Enjoy it? You first. Give me a reason to. Stop being a dick and I will. This isn't my fault. Well, it sure as hell isn't mine. You're the one who leaves. You may physically be here, but you're farther away than I am. You know I have a lot of work to do in my life. And I have an actual life. This is so stupid. Why? Because you're not in the right? You're not either. Stop being jealous of what I do. Jealous? Of going out and getting so smashed I lose my keys and having to pray that I'll be able to somehow get in? Don't look at me with that smug arrogance. You're such a prick. I didn't push you out the door. You didn't try to keep me in, either. I shouldn't have to fight for you. You should always be fighting. There's nothing to fight for. There's everything. We don't even have sex anymore. I got over that. Of course you did. You were the one who stopped it. I was going through a lot after what happened. Six months is more than enough time. You're right. I was fine. 
You were just too small for me. You just want blood, don't you? I'm willing to bleed, yes. To bleed? You've made no sacrifices for us what? in... None? None. Choosing to give all my time to you is more than enough sacrifice. I slave at my job to make life for us, and you throw it away. You keep talking about that. Is there nothing else? I'm so tired of hearing how jealous you are. Of you? Yes, I desperately wish when your friends ask what I'm doing with my life that you had to lie because the truth was too awful to admit. You'd actually have to have friends first. Forgive me for focusing on us. On us? When is our wedding day? Back. You can't even remember when we're getting married, but you remember the date of this company picnic. See, you're obsessing over the same issue too. Some things are too important to let go. I know! Why do you think I haven't kicked you out yet? That came out wrong. No, it didn't. You said what you meant. I'm sorry. I, I didn't mean that. It's just hard. And I love you, but... So what do we do? What we have to. Nothing else we can do. Beck, please. We can't we can... keep this up. You know it's for the best. That doesn't mean I want it. Doesn't mean I do either. That's not up to us anymore. Stay. At least tonight. We'll talk in the morning after we've been able to sleep. Neither of us will be sleeping. I need to go. Where are you going to go? Jer and... Yeah. It'll be fine. Sure, yeah. Beck, I love you. I love you, too. I wish that were enough. Here. I probably shouldn't keep wearing this. Just... Keep it on the table, please. Good night. Good night. <laughs> You're going to wake the neighbors. So? Let them hear. Come on. Get in here, quick. Are you embarrassed by me already? It'll take more than one date to do that. Who said you'd get more than one? Trying to scare me? Just warning you. I don't want you to fall too hard and fast, you know. You could get hurt. I'll try my best. So... Do you always invite girls into your place after the first to date? You're special. That didn't answer the question. <laughs> not wasting any time, are we? None to be wasted. Nuh-uh, not yet. I'm all for not wasting time, but I also want you to sweat it out a little. Fair, but just so you know, I don't kiss and tell. Can I get you a drink? So you can hooch me up to pry open my lips? I get your game. Move along. You make me sound awful. Nah, you're missing the part where I like it. So that's a yes? <laughs> that's a not yet. So no kissing, no drinking. You're taking all the normal date things away, aren't you? I don't know. What else is there? I could put on music and we could dance. Yeah? Absolutely. Which would lead to what? Who knows? Mm, uh-uh. Too cliche. <laughs> I thought girls liked that. I was wrong. Not cliche. Sexist. Then what do you want? Make me a sandwich. A sandwich? I'm sorry, is that a woman's job? <laughs> what kind do you want? What's your specialty? Follow me and see. You actually have a specialty. You ask? I was kidding. You have your key back. You could have let yourself in. No, that's not applicable anymore. Neither is the key. That's what you want. N I don't want it. We need it. Yeah. I'm... I know. I am too. When are they going to come by to help you move? A couple of weeks from now. I'm sorry. I wished it could be sooner, but I can't afford a truck and... It's fine. I don't mind your stuff still being here for a while. I'm kind of used to it. Yeah. Me too. I heard you went out last night with Jer. Yeah. Finally went outside without my files. <laughs> Sounded like you two had fun. We did. Uh, you should have met us. I thought about it, but I needed to finish some work. Deadlines can't always be pushed back, you know. Oh, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I should get going. Just wanted to drop the key off. Oh, sure. Yeah. Busy day? Yeah, I'm going to... It doesn't matter. It was nice to see you. Yeah. Beck? Yeah? I could really use a hug. hug. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> you eat this? It's better than you think. It's a deli cold cut with potato chips and mayo. I didn't say it was fancy. I bet you eat bologna with ketchup, too. You know me so well already. Oh, God. Gross. <laughs> Come on. Eat it. It's 
it's so disgusting. Just do it. You're not pranking me, are you? Like, if I eat this, you're not going to laugh and throw yours away? Promise. I guess that's everything. Yeah, finally. Who knew you had so much stuff? I did. Why didn't you say anything? Because I forgot. This is it? All right. This is surprisingly good. <laughs> <laughs> I told you. You can't blame me for not wanting it. Look at it. <laughs> That's them. Mm-hmm. Tell them hi for me. Come out and say it yourself. Another time. Sure. <laughs> Stop it. You're covered in cold cut juice and mayo. Embrace it. You can't make me. John? Yeah? It wasn't all bad, was it? Not bad at all. Stop! Hey, hey, hey! <laughs> no! <laughs> Tell me it's not forever? I could never leave you forever. You are listening on WIPZ.org and 101.5 FM. This is the WIPZ Radio Play Edition. And right now I have the one and only Michael Dahlberg, the playwright of So Far that you just heard. Thank you, Dahlberg, for coming on today. How are you? Absolutely. My pleasure. Uh, So what are your director's notes for this play? So for this particular one, I was interested in how it could be conceived on radio, because it, so much of it seems to be visually based right. in terms of four people playing in reality, one couple, and so much of it is how they physically intertwine, coming in and out of the space together. And so this one, as a radio play, seemed so intriguing <laughs> for you guys to be able to do, because how do you problem solve that? How do you still get everything to weave together and how, how do you get it to actually present itself in a cohesive way. So it was really delightful to then see uh, notes from Felicia about like, hey, can we change this little piece or can we change this or that to try to make it more clear or to otherwise help facilitate this medium. Yeah, it's, it's pretty different. It was interesting working on it, on it and myself actually working on this radio play I never worked on a radio play, so uh, thank you for submitting your work, and uh, I think it was a great challenge for both of us, uh, and Felicia. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So I just was wondering about the content of the play. Did you draw from uh, personal experience? You don't have to, like, get super into it, but I was just kind of curious, like, what sparked (laughs) the idea for this play for you? Sure. So for me, it was a particular breakup that I had a while back, where I left the relationship feeling, you know, of course, at first, like, you, like, I'm in the right, you know, you always leave it thinking you're in the right, (laughs) Right. but then after, like, some time passes, you realize, you know what, I probably could have been a better human being, too, (laughs) and as even more time passes, I think we all tend to understand sometimes things don't work. I mean, yeah, we all have those stories about like, oh, I was with so-and-so and and then they were really stupid or I was really stupid and something happened. Mm -hmm. But what's more compelling that we never really talk about are the stories of it just didn't work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's so frustrating on a personal level. Like this was one particular breakup where it just didn't work. Uh, It wasn't for a lack of trying. We, We were seeming to do everything right. You know, you you put in all this effort because you don't want to give up on something. And yet it ended up being our own story of even though we tried, it just couldn't happen. And that was something that I kept mining at because I was writing this initially as a response to the breakup and it wasn't going quite well enough. So I put it down for a while. And then about six months or so after, I picked it back up because I realized the whole play had started wrong. It wasn't about one person being right, one person being the villain. It was about how both people are protagonists in their own story, and they don't blame each other at the end. But how do you, how do you even have that story? So that, that then developed further in the play of how do we get this across where we can watch a relationship unfold 
and no one's the antagonist. No one is to blame. Yeah, yet, I saw I saw faults in both, but I also saw like their reasonings too, and I thought that was portrayed really well by the concept of having the couple in the past and the couple in the future at the end of the relationship. Like, how did you come up yeah. with that idea? To, to well, do... again, I, I think it probably had a lot to do with the fact that it was after this one relationship had ended, and I got drawn to when we think about these relationships in the past, we romanticize everything, mm -hmm. especially if a lot of time has gone by. And we, if something starts to fall apart, we, we tend to have that cliche, oh, things were so much better when, and we think about that one moment where we like maybe like got together and we had a date night at home, and oh, that was really simple. I loved yeah. when we could just be simple. And everything becomes kind of a wash of what it used to be, the potential that you had. And then you're immediately met with, yeah, but it didn't turn out that way because <laughs> after that, then this happened. But we always think that that next moment was so much further down the road. So I developed the entire play around this idea that as, the main, as one of the main characters is moving out, they're going through memory lane. And they start thinking about, oh... It was so great at this time when we were like this or remember this moment, but then that's immediately followed or is interacting in the same space as the following moment of, yeah, but then there was this. Right, so you're or like, you're wanting the, like that. the happy moments, but then you realize the reality. Yeah. Right, because we, I think we end up tricking ourselves. We end up thinking, oh, you know what? Everything was great. It could have worked. But then we have that moment of, no, it couldn't have because all of this happened. And so all of that is live together. It's not easily contained in little boxes. And so I wanted to have that on stage where we could literally see, no, this is one giant box and everything's jumbled together. You don't get one without the other. Right. Yeah, I like that. You don't get one without the other. I didn't think of it that way. But trying to also like keep it honest to what it is, keep it simple to what it is, because I do think that that's something that we can all really lean on as a common memory. I think most of us have that relationship, or several for that matter, <laughs> that it just didn't work. And there's nothing wrong with it, but boy, did it have potential. And yeah, you always this, get stuck on that potential. Yeah, there, there's yeah. this nostalgic factor that continues to live on with all of us. And if you're one of the lucky few who you are in a relationship that's there for the long haul and it's great, it's also a story that can remind you of where you came from, the good that was there, and the struggles you had to go through. Right, because it was left kind of open-ended, the ending, because it said, like, not forever. I don't remember the exact line, but, like, this may not be forever. Yeah. So I like yeah, that well, ambiguity. Uh, the ambiguity yeah, is nice <laughs> at the end because... We look at it and we don't know what the next chapter will bring. For all we know, this is a bump in the road and they'll be back. And they'll be, in, they'll be back together. Or they might be friends. Yeah, that's But that's the, ma the main piece for the takeaway of the end of the play is knowing that even though their relationship itself is over, they as individuals and they as their collective identity is not or are not over. So it's, it's not the end of anything, which I think is also a really nice feministic perspective that here we have this strong female character and we see her leaving from a relationship because it's for the best. Mm -hmm. But also knowing at the end, this decision that had to happen isn't going to make anything worse. Nobody is sad for naught. Yeah. It is something that must be done and it's something that has this positivity still ingrained. Something will still come out of this. There is hope. It is springing everlasting. And we don't know what it is. Right. But I think that's also part of the fun, that we don't know. So we get to walk away wondering what happened and kind of tell our own story. Yeah, like I feel like the characters kind of learned like a lesson from this whole experience. Can you elaborate on that a little? Sure, yeah. So each character is given kind of a, a major flaw in terms of how they live as an individual. And the play teaches them through their story how to better be 
an individual in a relationship. We see them trying to be just individuals that are in a relationship, but there isn't enough give and take in their right. equation. We see how one of them, in his own way, is giving, 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 but then feeling like he's not getting enough back. Mm -hmm. And then we also see the other one where, in her own way, she's giving, 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 but not getting enough back. Like, they're giving each other it, different things that, like, maybe they want something else, but they're but they're like, I'm giving, but it's not exactly what the other person wants. Right, yeah. So yeah. They're, they're speaking the same language, and yet they're not. Right. The, the currency that they're paying in is not the same, and mm -hmm. it doesn't trade. Yeah, that's that's a hard conflict. I, I think you expressed it really well. Um, I really well, enjoyed the play. It, it's tough. It's it's to me something that could be incredibly heartbreaking, and so it it's something that needs a careful bit of attention. I think to be staged, because I think it's easy to fall into that heartbreak, to fall into the negativity, and yet the whole purpose of culminating this work is to try to keep it bright, keep the hope that's there, and make sure that even though we have our pitfalls in the script where we, where we uh, dig deep, that instead we, we still walk out feeling better for it. And if anything, just cathartic personally in the audience from understanding having been in a similar situation and being able to give that up. Because, again, I don't think this is a conversation that we all really have. I can't really think of moments that I've spoken with friends about being upset at a friend or a romantic partner and walked away being like, we were both in the wrong, but when we both got things right, it just didn't work. I can't remember having that kind of conversation. That's, That's a true. very real subject that we never really talk about because we want to be the heroes of our own story. And that's not always true. We're not the antagonist of our own story, but it's not like we did everything we could have either. Right. There's a like little dynamic, like, give and take, like you said. Everyone's got their flaws, right. but also got their strengths. So I think that is Absolutely. really important to talk about because it, a lot of time it's really easy to play the blame game, you know, like, well, they did this. Right. And, you know. Absolutely. And this is all about not being able to do that and recognizing where, yes, okay, where this person has gone wrong, but also where you have gone wrong and where you can learn to grow and taking ownership of that, which at the end of the play, they both are taking that ownership, which is why it's open-ended. We don't know how it's going to continue after the play is over because we don't know if they're going to keep talking, if they're going to reconnect. We can just see that they've acknowledged their individual issues and that they're working on the first steps to correct those. I think that's really important. Yeah. I'm really glad uh, you you came up with this idea because it it's helped me even like in my own past relationships think about it a little differently. So thank you. For oh, well, thank you. Yeah. And I hope it I hope our listeners feel the same. I definitely hope that it resonates. I, I think it will. So I was just curious uh, about like your script writing in general. What like you kind of touched on it, how like you take some breaks sometimes when you write a play. Like what is your usual process for a play? So right. usually I, ha I have to try to set I have to set deadlines for myself. OK. Um, I usually have several ideas that I want to be working on and I have to just sit until I finally realize which one to go do. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes that can take a few weeks or a few months to finally settle out the arguments inside my own head about what what is screaming louder to be done. <laughs> but once I start a piece, I know like some people will start one thing and then they might take a break and start on another thing and then go back. I can't do that. Okay. I'm very singularly focused. So when I finally begin something, I'm in that until I've hit some sort of end result. So like for this particular piece, I had to pick it back up uh, quite a ways later. And so I did kind of let it go and work on other things because I wasn't ready. But then it started screaming again at me. And so I picked it back up to go look at. But that's not really a common occurrence. Oh. I, ha I have to just sit down, work on something. If I hit a roadblock, I have to just sit until I finally figure it out. And maybe I walk away 
But if I walk away for a bit, I'm not going to write something else. I'm going to let my brain just stew on it until I can come back to that exact piece and start again. Okay. I think, like, just because of, like, the nature of this play and, like, the concept of, like, the past and then the present, like, ending of the relationship, Mm -hmm. it kind of made sense that you took that break so, like, you could come to that conclusion, (laughs) you know? Yeah, just, just, like, I, I had to sit down when I got about halfway through the play. I had to map out the timeline mm. and figure it out for myself, like, how it was all weaving in. Because about halfway through, I realized I was running into these roadblocks because I didn't know the timeline clearly enough. Mm-hmm. It was all just kind of coming in, and I was doing it as it came out. But then when we get toward the end where things have to start to wrap up, I I didn't know where all the strands were to the story anymore. And so I had to sit down and just figure it out, figure out what the actual linear story was, and then go back to manually weaving it in and out with with the two angles of the timeline from the first half and the second half. So it... It took a bit of just engineering that <laughs> definitely took my brain a quick moment to figure out. <laughs> yeah, I think it, it all turned out pretty cohesive, so I think you did a great job. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. Um, so what are your plans for the future in your playwriting? Do you have any well, ideas brewing, right, screaming at you? Yeah, well, right now I'm working on trying to just submit. I, now that I moved to Chicago, I've spent the last year and a half trying to figure out what it means to be a working playwright. Mm -hmm. Um, Right now, I have finished the final rendition of a commissioned Cyrano adaptation that will be premiering here in Chicago at a small theater in the Rogers Park neighborhood in February. Oh, congratulations. So thank you. That's the, the next piece in the puzzle. But that came out of, you know, having a play done over for the Edinburgh Festival uh, last summer. And then the director, having, like, seen all of that, reached out to me, read some of my stuff, and then went, hey, this is great. I want you to write this for me. And so it was a collaborative effort. And it's been fun to figure that out. I mean, I have my own things that I want to work on, um, from just a personal standpoint, like older plays that I've written that I want to go back to and fix, and brand new pieces, which I'm still trying to piece together (laughs) in my brain um, before I, like, set down and begin. But right now I'm focusing on that Cyrano adaptation, trying to make sure that I'm available and ready for uh, actor and director questions when they go into rehearsals in January. And then after that, it's more of trying to figure out what to do next, submitting Mm -hmm. pieces I already have for competitions and sitting down and figuring out what to write next. I'm looking potentially at doing uh, another adaptation um, and this time doing perhaps Moby Dick as a stage adaptation. I know that there are a few that have kind of come around, but it's, it's been a story that because of storytelling really lends itself to theater and yet it has a lot of problem solving because it's such a large book with so much narrative that doesn't matter to any action. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's exciting to me. I'm also thinking about going back and redoing an old play about Elizabeth Bathory, who's one of the inspirations of Bram Stoker's Dracula. Oh, wow. But that's something that I already wrote, and now I feel like I'm ready to go back and fix it because oh. I can see where the problems are. Because it's been more time, I'm I'm not as personally connected to that draft anymore, so I can go through and start tearing it to shreds and rewriting it. Um, <laughs> That's those a good are way the, to go about the it. first initial pieces that I'm that I'm thinking of. But right now, uh, guns are blazing for the Cyrano adaptation <laughs> this coming year. That's a good visual. Guns blazing. <laughs> <laughs> I just like I just imagine you in your room, like guns blazing, like screaming, like just like. All yeah. these ideas, like, <laughs> I get my what... little little pop guns from when I was a kid. Keep it safe. <laughs> oh, fun! Don't shoot your eye out. <laughs> uh, so, uh, what advice would you give uh, to some up and coming playwrights? As just a keep up writing. and coming playwright yourself. 
Yeah, just keep writing. I know it's cliche. I know other people say it. I'm going to steal it and make it my own, too. <laughs> keep writing. Um, the only thing that has really improved my work has been just continuing to write. Um, it's always tough as a writer because it's so self-involved. And so you right. create this thing and you give it to people to read and maybe they like it, maybe they love it, maybe they hate it. Right. And you it's <laughs> learning to adapt to that. And it's, it's learning how to take someone's comment and if they don't agree with what you're doing, they don't like it, okay, now you have to weigh, do you care enough to make changes? Or is it what you want? I guess the greatest point I would make if I truly was to make this note from me okay keep writing for yourself i firmly believe that the first draft is something that you write for yourself you get everything out in the first draft that you wanted the play to be that you wanted the universe to be every edit thereafter is either refining your own idea or in response to someone else who read it or who will be in the audience. And so it's not really just for you anymore. And I think that's where people can fall off a little bit. They right. don't like having to get to the next versions. They don't like having to start writing for other people. But keep writing for you. And at the end of the day, if you get a note where you're supposed to change something about your play because your friend or whoever so that they don't like a piece of it, if making that change isn't going to make you happy sitting in the audience, don't do it. Oh, okay. You are your first and only guaranteed audience. I so like make that. sure that you are always <laughs> delivering for yourself. Okay, that's really important to think about. Yeah, because sometimes with, like, with all the feedback you get, like you might get the original idea lost. So. Well, absolutely. Yeah. Like, even, so, even so far... I've had notes about changing the younger couple because they seem too one note. They're too happy all the time. Oh, okay. But that's also the point because they're the past, and the past is nostalgic. The past doesn't have the errors that it really did. And so I can't make that change because it's one half of a couple. It's inherently two-dimensional. Like the juxtaposition of it like makes it like the contrast. Right. Yeah. Right. And so even though I've had notes about that for this particular play, when I sit down and I think about watching this show, no, that's the nostalgic half. That's the good half. Mm -hmm. That's the half I'm supposed to look at and be like, God, why couldn't it have been like that? Right, yeah. So it, it needs to be that, that note. But, again, that's coming back to me as my audience. Or, for example, I've gotten notes about, you know, if you make a certain joke in play that maybe, you know, this is like a reference to something that was written in whatever century. Your audience isn't going to know what this is. Hmm. Okay. At some moments, okay, so that joke needs to go. But other moments are, yeah, but I really think it's funny. <laughs> and if I'm, if I'm the only one that laughs, I'm okay with that. <laughs> That's good to accept that, yeah. Yeah, but, <laughs> but like you said, it's good to accept it. You yeah. have to acknowledge that maybe you're the only one that's going to appreciate that, but that also needs to sit well with you. You should be appreciating your own work because this is what you are sharing. I definitely am like the just... only one that laughs in a crowd a lot of the time. <laughs> yeah, right? But, but that's good. Yeah. You need to be that person sometimes because otherwise you're writing for everyone else, and then why are you writing? Right. Why aren't you doing literally anything else? <laughs> That's a good perspective. Like, that gives me a lot to think about. So thank you uh, for coming on today. And I was just wondering, uh, besides playwriting, what other positions have you been working on in theater? Or are you just focusing so, on that? Yeah. I am kind of dual submitting as a playwright and an actor right now. I've been kicking around the idea of dabbling back into directing a bit. Um, but I haven't quite made that leap. I haven't started submitting for those yet, but I'm feeling the itch. Otherwise, when I moved down to Chicago a few years ago, 
I was primarily um, submitting myself as an actor, throwing my headshot kind of everywhere that I could. And then I was writing on the side for fun for myself. Mm -hmm. And then I got an opportunity to be produced out of nowhere that I didn't expect to happen. <laughs> um, and that kind of took off on its own piece. Can you tell us a little again, more about that? Because I was writing for myself. Well, and I wasn't good. expecting production. It just happened. But I, I'm working on both of those angles. I've also been working in the city as an administrative assistant for a couple different theaters uh, off and on to try to get uh, some more just experience behind the table, just in the office, figuring out the goings-on of theater companies and how they tick. But primarily working right now as a playwright and actor. Interesting. Oh, that's great. I didn't know you were doing your administrative stuff, too. That's good perspective. Uh, trying to poke my head around. That's important. Yeah. <laughs> There's so many things you can do in theater, you know. <laughs> so. Yeah, right? <laughs> uh Okay, well, thank you, Michael Dahlberg, for coming on our special WIPZ radio play and being one of our first playwrights. Uh, it's Absolutely. been a pleasure the working pleasure with you. The pleasure is all mine. Yeah, so uh, it's always great working with you, and I'm going to wrap things up. Is there anything else uh, you would like to leave us with? Just that I hope the story resonated. And, of course, if anyone wishes to reach out, you can feel free to give them my email if okay. anyone wants to connect. Thank you for tuning in to 101.5 FM and WIPC.org. You're listening to the WIPC Radio Play Special. You can subscribe, download, and follow our show on SoundCloud, YouTube, and Facebook at 